Hello and welcome to episode number 308 of the Board Game Barbecue podcast, brought to you by Advent Games and our excellent Patreon. I'm Joe, I'm in the host seat today and I'm joined by two of my favourite people on the pod, both in Sydney. We've got Jules. Hello Joe, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing? I am a human being again after being very, very sick from my travels. So I'm very excited to talk today because I don't think I've been on the podcast for at least a month at this point. So I have quite the backlog of uh, games to talk about and experiences to talk about. Yeah, it has been a little spell. And for those of you who didn't know, um, Jules recently went to Gen Con and he unfortunately came down with the con crud and yeah, uh, was yep. very poorly for a little I while. I got it pretty bad, but I'm all good now. I'm ready to, ready to talk. Awesome. Someone else who's been poorly... Lauren, it's great to have you on the pod. How are you? It's good to be here. When you said your two favorite people from Sydney, we knew you weren't talking about Mitch. So <laughs> Me, yeah. there were spoilers. Spoilers were had. No, I'm really good. Thank you. I am also feeling much better. It's just it's making the rounds. It's that time of year. But I am very pumped to talk about some games. And why don't we go ahead and do that? So, Jules, it's been a while. Why don't we throw over to you and you can let us know what you've been playing? Oh, yeah. Uh, look, I think a good place to start probably would be Gen Con because that was the thing that happened first before the games I want to talk about because uh, I got a lot of the games I want to talk about at Gen Con. Um, look, I went over to Gen Con uh, through work, um, which was really, really cool. It is a phenomenal convention. The amount of people that are there and the amount of activities going on is astronomical and from my side of things a really well run convention and I'm sure there would have been hiccups here and there amongst the 23,000 events that go on over the four days Um, that's wild it's it's just insane I can't even begin to fathom it and I, I kept telling people that were asking oh like what was it like when they asked that that question And having reflected on the experience, I describe Gen Con as a convention where you get to go and you experience FOMO there, not FOMO from not going. And the reason is just as I described, there is so much going on, but you cannot humanly do it all. So you're there and you're just looking every direction and you want to go to five places at once, but you can't. So you're there and you have FOMO. Now, I probably experienced that to a larger degree because obviously I was there working. I wasn't able to just roam the halls and do whatever I wanted. Um, But it was just, it was amazing. Amazing to see that many people that enjoy and love the hobby, such a diverse crowd, so many games covering so many different wonderful themes and so many ideas that are on display. It was quite inspiring, really, really inspiring. And it was amazing to meet people that I'd been talking with online for years. Some of our Patreon members overseas, publishers that we have relationships with, just being able to meet them face to face and shake their hand and say hello was probably my favorite thing of the convention. Outside of the, obviously outside of the Patreons, who you would be the most excited to see, any really cool people you got to meet that you want to mention? Yeah, um, I got to meet Brooke from Leader Games. Um, She does their marketing. She was absolutely lovely to meet. I got to meet some of the guys from Chip Theory Games. Uh, They were really cool. Um, Oh, man, (laughs) I've met so many people. It's hard to remember everyone. Uh, A lot of different content creators, heaps of content creators. Uh, Alex from Board Game Co., Devin, uh, who works with Lucky Duck now, Oh man, who else did I meet? Uh, I got to meet Matt from Sharp and Sit Down briefly. They're, cool. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna miss a heap of names, but a lot of different content creators. Uh, so if I if you're listening and I met you, um, I appreciated meeting you. <laughs> I'll just say that out. And of course, they're all listening to the pod. Yeah, of course. That's <laughs> all anyone listens to. <laughs> Of course. Uh, I th- I think th- I think for me personally, one one of my favorite moments would have been meeting Adam Poots, though the designer of Kingdom Death. Um, I had a moment. Uh, I could step away from the booth, and their booth was literally 
you know, 20, 30 seconds walk from where we were. So I didn't have to walk to the other side of the enormous hall with tens of thousands of people crowded in. So it's nice and easy. And yeah, I just, all I wanted to say was thank you for making an amazing game. It's brought me a lot of joy and um, I had that opportunity to do that. And I, I took a photo with him and he is very gracious with his time. I, I didn't intend to talk to him very long um, and there were other people wanting to, but he he was lovely to meet. It was really, really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Have you been to Gen Con, Lauren, or have you been to one of those big cons before? I have not. I'm yet to take a big convention off the bucket mm. list. What about yourself, Joe? No, I haven't either. I, I, I'm thinking about going to Gen Con next year, but it takes so much forward planning and that is not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not one you just wing it. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. exactly. Are, the the people that go year after year, from what I hear, book their accommodation. As soon as it ends, they book the next year. It's a huge event, and right? Bars have like Gen Con themed menu items around yes. the city. Mm. Yep, they do. It literally takes over downtown uh, Indianapolis. Like the the exhibitor hall is quite large. If you've ever been to PAX in Melbourne, you'll look at it and you go, oh, it's a little bit bigger than the whole of PAX in terms of its floor plan mm. in the exhibitor hall. But then there's another whole hall with hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of gaming tables and Jeez. then there's breakout rooms within the convention center it's in and then they have thousands of tables set up in a sports stadium a few blocks from there and then every nook and cranny of a building that is open in downtown is booked for some sort of gaming event so it spills out literally over all of downtown uh, and everywhere you look there's just people with board game paraphernalia and bags with games and, and things like that. It's a wild experience. Like on 2035. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say. at a 7-Eleven server. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Lauren, because we just ran a convention, the thought of running a convention that big, the size of their spreadsheet must be huge. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah, it, right. it's... It's an amazing convention. I had nothing but a great time. I will say if crowds are not your thing, do not even mm -hmm. you know give thought to going to this convention because there are a lot of people. It was 71,000 people oh, over wow. four days and it was completely sold out, which is apparently the first time it's ever completely sold out every single wow. day. So it was mental, but I would wow. do it all again. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well. Uh, any um any like uh, unreleased games that you got to play that you want to shout out? Uh, I was, yeah, I suppose so. I picked up a few games uh, that I want to talk about today that were releasing at Gen Con ahead of their uh, retail release. There were quite a few hot games. I, I'd say two of them that were like you know games of the convention would be River Valley Glassworks was incredibly popular gnome hollow was also incredibly popular and also rock hard 1977 mm. was mental so good games publishing who i was there working for our booth was neighbors with devere who are the publishers of rock hard as soon as those doors opened every day there were people running for their lives to try and get to that booth and a line would form instantly going round the booth and then all the way down the hall. And they'd have to be counting numbers of how many cop They cut off uh, the, the lines at some point because they would only sell a certain number of copies each day to give everyone a chance each day to try and buy it. it I'm sure there was the same thing with Gnome Hollow. Um, I know that uh, Leader Games, their whole booth was just ARCs. They weren't selling anything else just wow. going hard on arcs and they had the Makes same sense. thing selling out each day as well. But yeah, just, just seeing people running for their lives was <laughs> quite the spectacle. <laughs> like I knew it existed, but I'd never seen it in person. And there were some very disappointed people <laughs> every day when they didn't get there quick enough. It's one of the perks of being an exhibitor. Cause uh, I just went, 
leant over the it went walked around the other side of the wall and said oh, can i buy a copy they're like yeah there you go thanks <laughs> so, <laughs> it's such a chill experience <laughs> but uh yeah really 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 cool so i, I might talk about rock hard because that's one that i have played so this is a worker placement uh, worker placement's the main mechanic of the game i suppose you're managing uh your money and you've got a job that you're trying to do in order to become sort of the biggest rock star, have the most fame. It's designed by, I can't remember her name, but she was the bass player of the Runaways. I can't remember the name. But an actual person who was in a rock band designed the game, and she was there at the convention and signing copies and things like that as well, which is really cool. cool. But I'm so impressed about how thematic the game feels. It's a real sort of mid-weight game. There's mm. lots of things you can do. But basically, you have uh, a figure that represents you, and the board's broken up into morning, evening, and after hours for different actions that you'll take during those three phases. And you've got stuff like, you know, make a mixtape, and then you can turn that into a record, and hiring extra band members and doing your day job to keep the income going. And then you do performances. And then after hours you go to bars and things like that and events happen. It's, it's just really, really fun. It's quite a tight game where money's really hard to come by until sort of the midway point where you've, you know, got, got some, uh, some of your stats going because your player board's really cool. It's got these, actual sort of amp dials on there that go up to 11. So you've got chops and reputation and songs, I think was the other one. So throughout all these actions on the different phases, you're just trying to up those stats because those stats, as they go higher, unlock your ability to perform at bigger venues, which give a bigger payout. And it was quite easy to learn. I, I We just read it from the rule book and had no issues whatsoever i was really impressed with the production it's it's just fun like i can't put it any other way it's just a really fun super thematic worker placement game and it was just smooth to play i really really enjoyed it i've seen some of the pictures of the marketing for some of these games at gen con which was just next level do you feel like the atmosphere of Gen Con creates kind of an environment of hype for these games that how like how can a game possibly support that level of like hype and enthusiasm (laughs) yes I absolutely look for me I just the sheer amount of hype and the line I saw forming every day was the reason I bought it and I had seen it on a lot of content creators you know sort of top games they're expecting to be a hit at Gen Con on YouTube before going so I knew about it before going, but I hadn't researched anything on the game. But I was like, all right, well, I'll pick this up. I'll put it in the board game barbecue library for people to be able to have a go at it. Uh, it's it's not a game that sort of is revolutionizing anything in worker placement. It's just a really, really fun thematic worker placement game that if, if you are at all into sort of classic rock um, history or, you know, you're someone that has a few bands that were you were in love with from the 70s and 80s and you followed their, you know, their life and you know, who those people were, it just, it feels so well set in that time period and the art is just spectacular. So it's not a game I can really fault. It has a fun, actually push your luck mechanic with um, candy, candy in quotation marks. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And the more you take, uh, the more you have to, basically if you take it, you flip a card off the candy deck and you have the chance of getting extra actions, which is really important because the more actions, the more stuff you can do. But as you do that, you dial up uh, uh, another dial for the candy and you have to roll a die. And if you roll lower than where that dial's set at, it means come the next round in the day phase, 
your action for that phase is forced to go to a uh, hospital or rehab. <laughs> so and so you basically, you, you basically lose an action. Yeah, so because you're, because you're, yeah, you've, you've got a sugar, sugar crash. Correct. So I, th- I can't remember what that dial's called. It could be crave. I think it's your crave dial. Something like that. It's but a yeah, bit that's... on the nose, much like the sugar, but <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So yeah, that's a fun mechanic in there, right? It's it feels very thematic and it's got yeah, that element as I said of push your luck. So you're like, ah, oh, because actually that's one of the things. If you end up in that rehab spot at the end of the game, you lose a bunch of points. So as the game progresses, you're ratcheting up this crave but you're like, I can't, I need to roll the die. And it's like, Mm. yeah, you know, what are my odds, you know, to roll the number I need so I don't have to go there. Mm. But yeah, very, very fun game. Can't really fault it. It's not, it's not my style of gaming, but I would happily play this anytime. It only takes, I don't know, hour, an hour and a half, depending on the number of players. It's not a long game at all. You can see, I'm just looking at photos um, online, and yeah, the the dials look like the dials you'd get on they are. Like, amps and speakers and stuff. And so, mm-hmm. you, Devere have just been on a tear lately. Just solid game after solid game after solid game. They're publishing. They've been have been really impressed with their output so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I I think that role is still going. Like, I think they've knocked this one out of the park. I don't expect it to be necessarily in people's like top 10 games of all time or it could sneak into some people's lists of you know top games of this year but it probably won't for me but as i've said three or four times now i can't fault the game if you love Mm. worker placement games and you love rock this will just be Mm. a perfect combo because i know there have been sort of band management that there's a feel of that in the game sort of style games before that haven't landed well, this is definitely the best of them, like by a country mile. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So that was Rock Hard 1977. Lauren, how about you? What have you been playing? I've actually been playing heaps, which is not necessarily always true to form. I was in Brisbane a couple of weeks back with Adrian. We played a bunch of games together there. He's already spoken about those. I've gone back to a few kind of blind spots in my gaming catalog. So things that are not necessarily brand new releases, but things I just had never got around to playing. One of those was Oceans, which was oh yeah released a couple of years ago. Uh, so Stu from our community came over and we played that game. It is actually really delightful. He has <laughs> the deluxe version. So he got the, the beautiful kitted out upgrade kit with the acrylic fish and everything was kind of bling to the, to the gills, shall we say. And <laughs> I, it was really lovely and thematic. The deep kind of sea cards make that game. Oh, yes. Mm. It's essentially a tableau builder where you have cards that are going to feed from fish, attack one another, but where you place them on your tableau and how they interact with the tableaus of the people sitting either side of you is really interesting part of the game because you can attack adjacent fish and effects will trigger and have cascading effects when, you know, fish to the right attacks my fish, but that could be Stu's fish that attacks and that triggers mine because mine's the fish to the right. We tied in this game. So the tiebreaker is how many of the same species, sorry, who has the most species? We have the same number Mm. of species. So the tiebreaker after that is the first person to get a job on a fishing boat in Alaska. So, Stu, I'm coming for that (laughs) one. (laughs) I'm I'm petty. I'll get that job. (laughs) Yeah, it was... was... I see that. I see that for you, Lauren. (laughs) It was really charming. It was really pleasant. If you like tableau builders, if you like cards with cascading effects and like beautiful art and kind of slightly immersive mesh of theme and mechanisms. It's lovely. So that was Oceans. Yeah, I I really enjoy Oceans. I back to the original Kickstarter. I've got that blinged out version as well. It's yeah, it's just solid. 
It's mm. really, really good. It is. I also really like how you can manipulate where the fish are in the central board because your yes. forage for fish or gain fish based on kind of card trigger effects and you can take, if you're foraging, take them from the reef, but there are these other parts of the ocean that when they're cleared, trigger certain card effects or card effects become yes. active, which change, you know, how many cards you can have in front of you or the kinds of effects that occur. And so you can be playing cards to manipulate the board state to kind of either fill those up because you do not want them to empty and trigger or mm -hmm. intentionally trigger and then refill them and trigger them again as a really nice interactive part of the game. Yeah. No, it's a brilliant game. I need to pull that out again. And that's it. That's what my month has been, right? Games that for the people who've played them, it's, oh gosh, I should play that again. Yeah. Mm. So yes, that was Oceans. Uh, another one I've played, which I know is one of Connor's favorites, is Beyond the Sun. Again, it's just real solid, right? Yeah. Yeah. I like, I do want to try it with the expansion because I think it adds some balancing things that maybe the base game needs, but the exploration of flipping a tech card or teaching the game to someone who's not played before and then uncovering or unlocking the tech and then they get to pick up a stack of cards or a few cards and say okay do i want this one or this one and just getting to see all the different upgrades that could occur that initial exploration in the game and seeing other people enjoy that is been a really nice part of beyond the sun that i feel like has kept it coming back to the table and wanting had me wanting to teach it to more people yeah, solid game. I, again, one's like, oh, I haven't played that for a long time. I should probably play it again. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my blind spots. I still haven't played Beyond the Sun. I don't know why specifically. I feel like I'd enjoy it, but just have not just haven't gotten around to it. I don't own it, but mm. yeah. yeah, I'd love I to give it a go. I don't own it either. I, I flip-flopped on it for quite a while, whether I enjoyed it or not, but it does have really satisfying combos or engines mm. that you can build in that game that you didn't know would exist at the start so it's it does have a fun you know revealing mechanism as lauren said that is quite quite surprising as the game goes on it's it just the the tech tree immersion as the game oh, oh yeah it emerging over the game just feels like there's so many different paths and things you could explore, but you can't do them all. You've got to find that that line and just abuse it and try and get all those victory points. But yeah, it's it's a great game. Yeah. What have you been playing, Joe? Uh, well, guys, <laughs> I did it. You did it. I did it. I got to play Ticket to Ride Legacy, which is one of my longest running oaths. I think I, I think I was my oath from the first episode I was on. Yeah. <laughs> mistake. Well don't, done. don't swear an oath to do a legacy game. That's a mistake. Um, yeah, so I got to play that with uh, my husband and uh, my siblings, and yeah, really enjoyed it. Played the first and they chapter. all enjoyed it. Yeah, they all enjoyed it. Dan, nice. Dan, uh, my husband, Dan loves Ticket to Ride and he smashed us that first round. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we, we, we really enjoyed it. And it was just basically the first chapter is basically a game of Ticket to Ride. But then at the end is when you start unlocking all the cool stuff and nice. like around the table, everyone was like, oh my God, I can't <laughs> believe that's what happens. Um, it was pretty cool. Uh, so really looking forward to playing the next Good. chapter. Was it a first legacy experience for the people around the table? Because if you've not experienced that before, what do you mean I rip the card? What do you mean this box opens? Was it that kind of, this is all very novel yeah. and new? Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, Dan and I have played Pandemic Legacy before, but the others had never played a legacy game before. Nice. So they were like, oh, my God, I can't believe we're doing these things to these cards. So <laughs> it was cool. Yeah, it was really fun. Um, yeah, and so I won't talk about it in detail because Dan's talked about it before, but, yeah, I just wanted to stake that claim and uh, say that I enjoyed it. And we're definitely going to play again. So that was good. Very cool. The other game I quickly want to mention before we move on to our sizzles was uh, Sherlock Holmes consulting detective for Baker Street Irregulars, which uh, we've talked about a bit recently, especially Mitch talked about it um, saying that it, it fell a bit flat for his family. So I just wanted to, I guess, talk about it and um, give a counterpoint. This game had a Tell profound... Tell him why he's wrong, Joe. <laughs> I'm not telling him why he's wrong, but just to, just to guess another voice. Yes. More than anything. 
this game had a profound effect on my sister, which was shocking. She's not a huge gamer. She enjoys video games and she'll play board games. But um, yeah, she was like, she was thinking, we, we had to play the first chapter over two halves because of when we started playing it initially. But she said that she was thinking about the game like the week, the all, all seven days, she was thinking about the case. And even to the point where we had a couple of extra people join us for the second half of it, which wasn't great, but she like, just without looking at her notes, like rattled off the story that had happened, what the case was, what all the things we uncovered were. And she like, she was saying people's names that without looking at notes and stuff, like I was shocked at how, how much it got its hooks into her. And I think what Mitch said was right. It's really off. It's it's really sandboxy. There's not very many rails. Um, but I think, I think I'm not sure why it was different for me and my sister, maybe less people better potentially, but it just like, it felt like you are part of this street gang that are helping Sherlock Holmes. And it feels like you are really like going through and trying to uncover this story. And we got pretty, pretty bang on for the, the result it was just a couple of questions we got wrong, but we got most of it, and we just made us feel really good. It does do well with people who have not been into board games at all before. Mm. I'm not saying as a kind of a broad sweeping statement, but it definitely has that capability. I've had mm. friends who have brought their non gaming partner over, and we've played that, and they've gone and bought out, gone and bought a copy of it, and that's happened several times. I think if it does, if it does land, it can really land. And I can, I get that it can bounce off people. That's totally fair. But I think it, if it hits, it can really, really hit, which is so nice. I think it makes, it makes sense because, you know, some of the language in board games and even the, the design language of the mechanisms is relatively opaque or like it's, it's very specific to board games, you know, the worker placement mechanic, for example, a drafting mechanic, whereas everyone's seen murder mysteries, you know, mystery films, shows. And so it is, it essentially feels like that. So people probably more naturally have that language and are able to follow those threads potentially. And it did feel like that. Like you're, you know, looking up names and you're like, wait a minute, this person it, like wrote this article, maybe they're, maybe they know something they haven't said in the article and then we go search for them in the in the phone um, listings or the address listings and then you go talk to them and you realize that's true and you feel really clever it was just yeah I really enjoyed it and I think I think I wonder if um, now that they know how it works I wonder if Mitch's family actually would enjoy it if they they gave it another crack it's not one I've played but I'd like to try it mm. so yeah like, do you like murder mysteries? Are you into true crime or murder mysteries or anything? Not, not in a big way, but I, I think I'd enjoy just the puzzle, mm. I, I, the the logic puzzles or deduction that you have to to do. Yeah. I certainly know my brother. I for many years I bought him some of those unlock games each year for Christmas or or his birthday, and he'd open it up and just like solve it super quickly <laughs> he's just got <laughs> he's got God. the mind for it um and i and we'd start, play some of them together and i would really enjoy that but this would be like to the next mm. level kind of thing yeah that's cool mm -mm -mm. so that was sherlock holmes sherlock holmes consulting detective the baker street irregulars which is the green box and ticket to ride legacy was what i played why don't we move on to our sizzles <laughs> Lauren, what's sizzling for you? Okay, mine's going to be a, a quick sizzle, a little quick sear on the pan, if we will. It is a game by a board gaming giant in the, I guess, um, creative space or the board game space, which is uh, Vladis Fartil. And mm. the dude's got range. The dude's he got does. range. <laughs> <laughs> I have played several of his beefier games and also code names I played for many, many years. But recently I got to play a game of his that I'd never tried before a couple of months ago and have since played it so many times. And that is Pictomania. Have either of you played Pictomania before? I feel like I have once, but I honestly mix up 
all of these picture related games in my head. I know what the box looks like. I can see the image in my head. Yeah, like the blue and it's got a little drag and anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I've not played games like Doodle Rush. A yes, few I've games played that one. Relate to drawing really quickly. Yes. Mm. So this was the first of that ilk that I tried. Mm-hmm. Essentially, in Pictomania, you're playing Pictionary, but kind of all at once. So there is a card that comes up that everyone can see. And it'll have a row of words. And so there'll be three cards that will have a row of kind of semantically similar words. So on one of the more, like one of the easier cards, it might be something like pot, pan, ladle, bowl, something like that, right? And then on one of the more difficult cards, it might say something like tavern, inn. So there's all kinds of words that clusters, but there's three of those. And everyone is going to get a number letter combination that's going to relate to a kind of grid location on that um, board, if you will, of all of the different words. So I know that I'm, you know, card A, word two, that's bowl, right? But the thing is, everyone has a different number. So if I'm number two, then that means I know that Jules can't be number two on cards B or C, which is important for the point that I'm going to come back to. Right, yes. So in the game, what you're going to do is you want to draw your thing as quickly as you flip and can because you can only start guessing other people's drawings once you finish drawing yours. So you're going to draw yours ASAP, turn it around so everyone can see it, and then you've got these tokens that you're going to use to guess what everyone else's is. So, and you just stand up and frantically around, just placing on whatever you think everyone has, all these different numbers, right? Beauty of that is, is that you want, you want your drawing to be good enough that other people can guess it, but not too good because you need to be first guessing other people's because at the end of the round, your score is going to be how many guesses you got right of other people, but you're going to lose points for all the people that didn't guess yours. Oh, yes. So, I love that. Oh. That is very similar to Doodle Rush. Yeah. It, sure, they, I'm sure they all kind of share a similar DNA. Mm. So, and then there's like an extra token if you are the first to get it. I'm simplifying a few things, but that's essentially it, right? It is frenetic. But the best part of it, and this beautiful tiny little wrinkle, is that because none of the numbers double up, if I'm number two, no one else can be number two. What ends up happening is that you're frantically guessing. I'm like, yours is definitely bold. Jules number two, and I put two on yours, right? Because you only you don't need to get the card right, only the number. So I don't yeah. need to guess whether your card A, B, or C. But then I look over, and Joe is drawing something that is absolutely a giraffe, and that was two. I'm like, well, shoot, bowl is wrong. I've stepped up. <laughs> and so there's these kinds of moments of immediate regret and running in and then knowing you've goofed. And me never remembering that I shouldn't guess my own number for other people <laughs> because they couldn't yeah. possibly have it. <laughs> it is it is so much fun. It is the most fun I've had playing a drawing game in a very long time. It's people standing up, leaning over the table, slamming down cards. It is absolutely bonkers crazy. But my goodness, did I have a good time. I didn't think that you could make these kinds of tweaks. When I heard about these kinds of rushed fast-paced drawing games i thought that's not for me that actually just sounds a bit stressful i like a quaint Mm. game of pictionary with my family it's a real pleasant time except (laughs) if i have to draw like tubular bells and and no one can guess it it's frustrating but for the most part it's a lovely time it was it really surprised me it surprised me how engaging it was how simple it was everyone got on board you could quickly move between rounds. It was really, really snappy. And you just kind of want to play it again and again and again. It's so Moorish. And I mean, Blada. It's, it, he's like amongst the goats for a reason, right? He's so good. Yeah. Pick, yeah. Pictomania. Huge fan. Okay. So I ha- I haven't played this. I've seen videos of it. And the, uh, the other game we kept referencing, it's, I think I'm pretty confident it's actually Doodle Dash now that I remember it, which I have played. But yeah, I I love Doodle Dash, so I'm going to love Pictomania for sure. 
Yeah, it's awesome. It's it sounds like one of those games that brings the energy back up. You know, mm-hmm. after lunch at a game at a game event where you that's starting to crash, I use monikers for that. I to get energies back up again, and so it sounds like a great addition to like those sorts of games. Yeah, I, now that I've got it, it, I just can't imagine ever getting rid of it. It's not for every occasion, yeah, but with people who are up for just a bit of chaos, yeah. Awesome. Well, I hope it's in the Melbourne Library. I'd love to give it a go. Yes. <laughs> I think I may awesome. have stolen the Melbourne copy. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm <laughs> <damn you. laughs> uh, well, that was Pictomania. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Lauren. I might, I might go next with my sizzle. Mm-hmm. So speaking of goats, I played a game recently by the good doctor himself, Dr. Knizia. Uh, it's called Escalation. Mm. Have either of you heard of Escalation? Before? No, I have, I have not. not even heard of this. Oh, I think you both would actually love it. So it's one of uh, Reiner Knizia's Japanese-only games. So it is a little tricky to get, but um, I talked to someone recently who said they were able to get it off maybe Amazon Japan, I think. Okay. So it's Escalation with an exclamation mark. Um, <laughs> I, sorry, I just I'm looking it up because I haven't heard of this. The cover is something. Oh my else. god! <laughs> it's this. There is a grandma card with it's... a bazooka. <laughs> oh yeah, there is a card which has got like a, a schoolgirl with pigtails with like an AK forty seven. What? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're bearing the lead. So, uh, so escalation is a card game. It's a ladder game. So it's a game where you're essentially playing cards from your hand in increasing value so if someone plays a two you'll need to play something higher than a two for example from your hand the game's played over four rounds and it's got a couple of interesting tweaks that make it actually quite fun one is that all that matters is the value so when you play a card you can play a single card or you can play doubles or triples or quadruples of the same number so that's the the only thing the only rule is has to, if you're going to play multiple cards, has to be the same number that you're playing. But then really all that matters is the value. So if someone's played a uh, five, then you can play two threes to be a six, and then that's valid, and then the next person goes. So so that literally is the game, is you're going from lowest to highest. The really fun thing about this is that if you can't play a card, you have to take all of the cards in the middle. Oh gosh! And every card is a negative point, and it's one of those oh. games where you're trying to not have the lowest points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it ended up that I just I I think the first couple of rounds I was like, yeah, no cards, suck on that, guys. And then by the end, like I got like a massive pile, and ended up <laughs> not winning as a result. Which is really fun. It's one of those games. It's very light, very very um, easy to play, easy to teach. It's a bit random, but the randomness is unwelcome because it's a quick game. Yeah. And it just felt really fun to, like, get people to take cards, you know, take the stack and highly, highly recommend it. If you can try and get a copy, the 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 um, one that I played with was a copy that had on the cards themselves and on the box uh, meeples and pieces from Rana Kinitsi's different games. So mm-hmm. it wasn't as ridiculous as the one that's about, like, trying to protect your backyard in a nuclear war, which right. is why you've got a granny with a bazooka and a primary school girl with an <laughs> AK-47. I would love to get a copy of that one because that looks ridiculous. But, um, yeah, hi- if you can find a copy, highly, highly recommend it. Another nice like little in-between two other heavier games kind of game. And we played a couple of rounds. So it was just, it was great. Very cool. Do you feel like you need to have played similar card games like it before or it's really low barrier to entry 100 percent, because it literally is you just got to play a number higher than the number that's in the middle at the moment mm. and it can be any combination of cards as long as it's the same number i think there was even like a there was a wild card so you could add that to, for it to copy another number so if you had two threes you could add this wild to make it three threes and then there was also what was really annoying is that there was like a past card and there's only like two maybe three in the deck uh. and so if you didn't have the number, you could like, and it was a ridiculous, it was like 21. There was like a huge number. <laughs> you could then pass and then give it to the next person. And so <laughs> yeah, it was just, yeah, it was good. That, so that was escalation, es- exclamation mark. Jules, what are you sizzling? All right. Um, my sizzle today is a game that I picked up from Gen Con from all play. It's Things and Rings. 
Now, I I had heard about the game ages ago from Amy and Maggie, and I thought it had already been out and it had done the rounds and just had never made its way to Australia yet. But I don't think that was the case. They must have had an early copy or seen it at a, a, a show overseas early because I think Gen Con was its sort of big release. I could be wrong on that, but it, it feels like it was new because it was also a highly sought after game and a lot of people talking about it. Things and Rings is a really interesting game. So you'll have one person playing as the Noah and it's kind of like a, not really a DM for the game, but you need to have a person that's a guide for the game and they're not, they're not really playing it. So that's kind of a, you know, not a caveat, but just a, a forewarning that you have someone that sort of guides the game experience. They're not actually playing it, but I imagine what you do is play play around the table to, for it so everyone gets to do that role. Um, and then the rest of the people are trying to, uh, uh, the people trying to guess uh, the, cl- well, not the clues, but the rules of the game. So things and rings, you have a deck of cards with a whole bunch of stuff, just random everyday items or other stuff, you know, from flies to skyscrapers to bears or whatever the case may be, just hundreds of cards. And you have these three pieces of string, which you lay out on the table and form a Venn diagram with them. And you've got a red, a blue and a yellow string. And each of those strings the different colors that form the Venn diagram obviously have a different rule for each circle. You can dial up or down the complexity of the game by taking out one of the rings. So you've got a less overlapped uh, Venn diagram. But to me, it's just play with all three. That's that's the funnest way to do it. So uh, you also have a little token that has the word none on it because sometimes there are items that fit none of the rules on the table. You have a deck of cards also for each of the three rings. And the three different categories are attribute, there's um, context, and there's word. So the word one is the yellow one. That is the rule for the word. And again, there's a deck of cards that relate to the word rule. And you have one card of each and the knower gets to see all three, and they are dictating where the cards land. But the word is to do with the structure of the word. So if our word was elephant, the rule for the word on that particular game might be starts with a vowel. So elephant would fall within the yellow circle. And then red is the context. No, context is blue. Red was the attributes. So attributes is literally to do with the physical properties of the object on the card. So whether it's made of metal or if it's man-made or whatever. And then blue was the context. So it's position or use in society. So it might be you can find it within a home or you might say used by emergency services. You know, those are the types of rule cards you could expect to find. So the goal of everyone else playing the game is to try and get rid of all five cards and they get rid of a card by placing it correctly. Now at the start of the game, the person who is the knower will draw three cards and put them in their correct positions. And as people play the game and put the cards down, if it's placed incorrectly, the person who is the knower will say that's incorrect. They take the card up and they put it where it does belong. If the person places it correctly, then they just get to play again. And if you're wrong, you have to redraw a new card. So you've made no progress getting rid of your cards. First to get rid of all five cards wins. But what emerges is as you play more cards and they get moved to their correct position if they're played incorrectly, more and more objects start to stack up within these circles and the overlapping areas within the Venn diagram. And you're just trying to figure out what the rules are based on what you can see placed where within the Venn diagram or not in the Venn diagram. And you don't have to guess the rules to win the game. It's more you're trying to figure it out so you can place your cards correctly and win. And it is just so delightful to have these moments where 
one game I remember was uh, one of the overlapping areas uh, for the Venn diagram had a mosquito and a diamond in the same area. You're like, what do they have in common? This makes no sense at all. And you're just absolutely racking your brain as to what do these things have in common? And the rule for that one was has a point or a, a, a sharp end. And I was just like, ah, oh, of course. Like, it, it's just brilliant to see all these random objects placed in a Venn diagram and they absolutely have a rule associated with them and you're trying to figure it out. And me as a player once going, I know exactly what the rule for that Venn di- that circle in the Venn diagram is. I absolutely know it. But then I look at my hand of cards and I go, but nothing fits in there. So I don't know where to put these other cards because I haven't figured out the other rules yet. It is just a delightful game to play. It's a great, it's a really great game for people that have not played board games before. It's just hidden rules. You're trying to place them correctly. And it's just really, really fun. Now, I will say my experience and has been the experience of others with being the knower of the game. There's definitely times where you've got to make a call on objects that are a little subjective. For example, I remember one of them being, uh, one of the rules was you'd find this in a school and it's like, sometimes it's like, uh, you could find this thing in a school, but maybe not. It can be a little tricky as the knower to make a consistent line of, of ruling on where the cards go, but it's a very light, fun game. It doesn't take that long to play. So it's kind of just, you just, pick a line of logic and try and stick with that and be consistent with your placements. Um, yeah. Does it, do they have anything in the rule book to have like D and D rules where it's like the DM's always right. So the no, yeah, is, always the no right. is always right because everyone else doesn't know. So at the end of the game, look, you could debate things, but it's, it's not a long game. To yeah, be well, honest. So yeah, I, I've just found this super, super fun, really addictive to be like, trying to figure out the rules based on a random assortment of things and yeah it's fun i got the uh expansion pack which just added a little more cards but it had really weird things like the necronomicon (laughs) (laughs) just random random objects that yeah that are just a bit more silly and you and not in real life so things and rings absolutely delightful does it have the thing that things like Decrypto and Codenames have of the sheer frustration when you're giving a clue of just, how are you not on my wavelengths? How are you not getting this? Or oh, this is going to be so obvious. They're definitely going to get this. And then just no one picks it up. Or is there is enough on rails that that doesn't happen? Yeah, it's more like, because obviously it's a competitive game. And you're trying to get rid of your cards first. It's what's really funny to see is a couple of players will latch on and go, oh, yes, I've totally figured out the rule for that ring. I I know what's going on. But then can be completely wrong, but the rule they thought it was still was correct given the number (laughs) of things that were in there, but it wasn't actually the rule. It's been really, really funny to see. Like I said, you don't have to figure out what the rules are. You can kind of just get vibes of, well, these types of things in there are in there and this card in my hand is sort of along those lines. I have no idea what the rule is, but I think it would go with those things. And sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. You can also place the cards in the none area. That's a valid placement if you think it doesn't apply to anything. Mm. Yeah. It's funny you say that because that kind of going down the wrong line of thinking but still lucking a win happened to James and I recently. We played Decrypto in Brisbane with MJ and Adrian. And we we beat them, but we were dead set that one of their words was cold and the word was mm-hmm. camera. Like we were, we were not even close. <laughs> but then they used one word I think was snap and I was like, oh, cold snap, done. We got it. Uh, it's definitely yes. that. And so we won, but we were just not on their wavelength at all. Yes. We just kind of, they all of their clues happened to fall into something totally different. Yeah. Yeah, that, that can absolutely happen. But yeah, it's just... I, I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's just really delightful and it's fun trying to figure out the rules, especially when you see those wildly different items and you just like, how, 
how do those things have anything in common? Mm-mm-mm. So yeah, absolutely love it. Awesome. That was things in rings. And so that's our sizzles. So it was things and rings, escalation, exclamation mark, and uh, Pictomania. Three games I now very much want to buy. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Let's go on to the announcements and news. All right. So uh, coming up, we've got the board game barbecue spring Melbourne game day on the 21st of September. So that's at the gaming arena in Coburg. Tickets are selling steadily. So we're almost at halfway sold. So highly, and we've got like four weeks to go. So highly recommend that you jump on it. If you haven't yet, we'll make a few announcements in the coming weeks. So keep an ear out from that uh, across all our socials. We've also got the next Sydney board game barbecue day. Do you guys want to chat about it? Yeah, uh, that's on the 2nd of November at the Castle Hill RSL. Uh, The tickets are more than halfway sold at this point, and it's not until November. So if you are listening and you live in Sydney or want to travel to Sydney for this, buy the ticket right now. Stop, pause the podcast, (laughs) go buy the ticket now because they're going to run out. (laughs) Same with Melbourne. Do it now. <laughs> yeah, so head along to eventbrite.com and just search up Board Game Barbecue and you'll find where you can get the tickets and highly recommend you buy them now, like Jules said. If you're looking to add to your board game collection without taking out a second mortgage, then look no further than Advent Games. Dean and the team don't just sell games, they play games. They know games, they love games, just like us. The first thing you notice when you head to adventgames.com.au is the amazing range of games. Dean and the team have worked tirelessly to make sure that every game is properly catalogued into the website. You can search by card games, dice games, family games, gateway games, solo games, and games from your favourite designers. And they don't just have games, Advent has a huge range of RPG books, game inserts, organisers, sleeves, even miniatures and scenery to make your next game night an experience to remember. Shipping is a flat $10 if you live in the Sydney metro area, $15 for the rest of Australia. And don't forget if you sign up for their newsletter, every Friday you receive an email with the latest specials, newest arrivals and a list of all the games that have just come back into stock. So there's no excuse for missing out on that game that you desperately want in your collection. So why not grab your next sizzling game from Advent Games? Head to adventgames.com.au now. All right, now it's time for us to recap the last question of the pod. So uh, last week's question of the pod was, what is your favorite deaf moment from the podcast, as was Deaf's last episode? RIP Deaf. Not that Jeff's dead, but, you know, RIP from the podcast. Rest in, in podcasting. Rest in podcasting, yeah. That's it. That's, that's, um, so, uh, should we go on and read yeah. what our community had to say? So, Jules, take it away. Yeah, so a couple of comments from Facebook. We had uh, Carl van Ostrand said, oh, man. I just loved hearing his passion and enthusiasm for those extra meaty games. And we had Buon or Da say Kanban is life. Surely I'm pretty sure please. that's I'm pretty sure that's the last, last tattoo de- Def got on his chest. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it was that or uh, Lisboa, I can't remember which one. <laughs> uh, we also had uh, Maddie Chaplin said, love Def. He knows how to put words in front of words and make it engaging. Yeah, no disagreements there. Yep, and from Discord, uh, Chris says, my favourite deaf moment is listening to descriptions of games that I have no interest in playing, like 18xx, Coin, and the Valiant Defence stuff, but still wanting to play them. Brilliant. That's uh, definitely the mark of a good sales pitch. Wutaji? Wutaji? Uh, says my favorite moment was definitely the moment you were dipping your toes into the GMT games and went off about the, the rule book, but still persevered and now love them. Those oh, rule man. books are hot trash, but they are pretty bad. <laughs> they know they don't need to mess with the rule books because the community is going to put out an even better play raid and the games are still going to be great. That's it. And Shoitan get a very lovely response in the discord. And this is just a little excerpt from that which was, Def was my Sherpa up the mountain of heavy Euros. 
Now I feel like we're embarking on a new chapter of very high interaction games together. Def, I may hear your voice less, but I'm looking forward to rolling raid dice into your unprotected cities for many years to come. If you know what I mean. <laughs> Is that a John Company awesome. reference? Is that the... <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. I actually don't know what it's referring to, but it sounds almost sexual. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear brilliant oh dear well um all the best def you know he um he'll be fine he's already smashing it on twitch getting on there i'm like, pretty sure he's day. in an arcs campaign right now exactly yeah <laughs> he's he's living his best life that's so it's, it it's all good all right on to the next question of the pod so our next question of the pod was uh we kind of got together and we started talking about what what could the next question be? And so I think we want to end the podcast on a little high. So the question of the next week's question of the pod or this week's question of the pod is what's got you fired up this week? We want to know what's got you excited. Is there a game? Is there a Kickstarter that's coming out soon that you want to hear about? Yeah, just what's what's got you fired up. And uh, let us know. We'll post this on our socials in our Discord and uh, we'd love to hear from you. You will hear from us a little bit later. Before that, we just want to shout out to our Patreons and uh, let you know that if you want to help support the pay- the podcast, like our excellent Patreons, head along to patreon.com slash boardgamebarbecue. You can sign up there and donate a monthly amount. It gives you access to exclusive podcast episodes that we record just for our Patreons. Often they're a bit silly, a bit off the wall. And uh, we get to let loose a little bit more on those. So highly recommend uh, you uh, have a look at that on at uh, patreon.com slash board game barbecue. However, actually what really helps us if you love us and want more people to listen to us is to spread the good word. You know, word of mouth is one of the best ways to convert people into new podcasts in general. So uh, tell your mates, tell your friends, tell your auntie who's just recently getting into Pictomania let them know about the podcast and we'd love to have them be part of the community. You can, the other thing that really helps is if you go to Apple podcasts uh, or Spotify and you leave, leave a star rating, it'd be awesome. If you leave a review, make Dan sing, dance, recite poetry. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's legally required to read out all of the, all of the review handwritten reviews, but don't have to do that. If you just want to log on quickly and give us a star rating, it really helps us quite a bit. Otherwise get involved with the community, jump on Facebook, jump on our discord. You know, you can follow us on X or RIP, RIP Twitter, uh, Instagram or YouTube. And uh, we'd love to see you there. If you want to find where all these places are, have a look at our show notes and the links are all there. All right, Jules, RIP something else. Yeah, in what was probably the shortest lived spoiler in history. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And as if you've listened to last week's episode as well, you will have heard uh, a hint about the oaths being no more. Uh, Yeah, this is the first episode where there are no oaths. Uh, Everyone was exonerated and... Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Look, you two thought you had it tough. Try four and a half years. (laughs) Here's a secret. Laura and I just didn't care. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) That's it. You're not wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Look, the the O's was an idea that has stuck around from the beginning of the podcast, and it has been fun. And to to be honest, like, you know, we it was something we definitely took really seriously and we really tried hard to, to do our O's every time we came back on the podcast at the start. And there have been times where it's been more difficult than others. And then we started branching into not just games, but making other promises and it's evolved over the years, but I think it, we just felt it was a good time to mix things up and try something different and try and end the podcast on a, a bit of a high note as well. Because sometimes the uh, O's were abysmal failures. <laughs> sometimes. I have, def- I have mm, definitely sometimes. been part of that. <laughs> 
No, but uh, yeah, you you won't hear us doing oaths anymore. And look, it doesn't mean you can't make an oath on your own if you ever so choose to. There's just no official segment for it at this point in time and henceforth. But to replace that is relating to the question of the pod that Joe talked about just before. We're going to call this segment Fired Up. You know, with board game barbecue, there's all the puns you ever need. So, uh, fired up, as Joe said, and what the question is, what's got you fired up this week? It's literally just a moment for us to talk about something we're really excited for, whether it's a Kickstarter that's coming, uh, a game that you just purchased, or a high gaming moment that you just wanted to talk about, whatever is the embodiment of excitement and got you fired up. So we're going to have a crack at this. I'll start us off. For me, I'm excited. Yes. I'm excited. I'm fired and, up. And I, <laughs> and I am genuinely excited for this. Uh, what I'm talking about and I'm fired up about is the Cloudspire Harbinger campaign. So this is the last installment for the Cloudspire game. There's going to be three new factions and a whole bunch of other goodies. I am so, so excited to throw my money down on this one. I got to talk to the Chip Theory guys, uh, well, one of them in particular at Gen Con and just said, do you have any stuff here for that? Because I want to see it. And they said no, but they pulled their phone out and showed me some other stuff that I can't talk about. But it is just really cool. It's one of my favorite games. The new factions are going to be absolutely insane. I'm excited for all of the content to come for it. So Cloud Spire Harbinger campaign, if you aren't if you aren't following it already, it's going to be on GameFound. So you head over there to follow the campaign. It's launching within the next couple of months. It's not far away at all. And they've already got a little bit of content on the page to, to have a read through. Not much, but there's a little bit there. So, yeah, Cloud Spy Harbinger campaign. I'm very, very fired up for that. Awesome. Cloud Spy, is, I've, we've, I've got the um, barbecue library copy yep. here and it's burning a hole in my collection. Oh, my, have I not played collection. it with you, Joe? No, every time we've tried to it just hasn't panned out okay i'm so keen to give it a go ah uh, so okay we'll try and change that yes lauren what's got you fired up well i had a choice between two things <laughs> so the first is that i'm getting married in exactly four weeks today so Ooh. next by the next time i'm on the pod i will be a married woman james and i will be the things in rings and yes, yeah. oh. <laughs> terrible, terrible joke. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but the other thing that I'm arguably more excited about <laughs> is a campaign that we talked about on some of our communities online, which is a sequel to semi sequel to Thousand Year Old Vampire. There's a campaign, so you've met a thousand year old vampire, and to be honest, I've not looked much into the sequel because I kind of want to be surprised. I'm not normally like that. I'm normally happy to go and have a dig around and see what it's about. But this one, you know, I'm just going to blindly back it because I mm -hmm. enjoyed the first one so much. So that is on Backer Kit now. If you liked the original or never tried it, but, you know, saw some of the reviews kicking around, then get amongst it because I am Super amped for that. It is just some of the best solo role playing I've ever ever experienced. So yeah, that's uh so you've met a thousand year old vampire. Joe, what's or, what's what's got you fired up? What's got me fired up? Well, my number one game, Root, is about to have an expansion whoop, whoop. on Kickstarter. It's uh, it doesn't have a name for they don't have a name for the expansion yet, but it's by Leader Games, obviously my one of my favorite. Um, publishers and I'm so excited it's the bats and toads expansion mm. and some really interesting mechanisms that I've been reading uh, you know they've been releasing pictures of the you know, every time they update the faction boards and so I'll just read we'll read through the faction board and have a look and see what it's about it looks really cool the bats look like they interact with other players 
hands from what I can tell in some way. And they have this kind of area majority thing where they're trying to have, I think, be in certain clearings to then interact with the other denizens of the woodland in some way. I haven't, I haven't really looked into it too far. Do you know much about them, Jules, the bats? No, yeah. not a whole lot. From, from memory, it's if you're fighting in a clearing where the bats are, there are things that you then have to do um, if there's a, someone who has majority, if the bats have majority in that clearing. So, so it really, it sounds like it's going to really change the board state quite a bit because you'll have to start factoring in all the bats are here. So now it changes how I'm going to have to approach mm. things. And then the toads, it sounds like they're more of a, a wandering faction. And so they seem that from what I've seen, they sound a bit more like the otters in that they're kind of wandering through a bit more, uh, or maybe even like a, a blend of the otters and the vagabond. Yeah. Um, and so, so again, they interact in a, in a different way. I'm just always so fascinated at how they can have had so many factions and have fresh, interesting mechanisms and I guess maybe as a testament to the core design of the game by um, Cole and the team, Cole Worley and the team, is that it does have this flexibility to add new mechanics and change things up a bit. Do either of you know much about the process they go through to play test these factions? How do they how do they cook them up? How do they? Yeah. Them? So yeah. So um. One of the things that Leader Games does really well is community building, and they've got a great Discord, the Woodland Warriors uh, Discord, and so they've got like a steady tap of online playtesters who are just love the, their games and are very happy to playtest them and play them again and again and again. So, so I'm pretty certain they do it that way. I, I know that they do in person playtesting, and I think they're in St. Louis. Uh, yes, I believe so. So I think they do in-person playtesting as well. And they've got regular playtesters that come to their to their um, uh, office location. But I think the majority of it is online through TTS, um, and that's that's how they do it. And I think they just play the hell out of it as well themselves. So um, they're always very good at doing that. Yeah, I'm so excited for this, and I'm hopeful. I don't know if this will be the case. I'm hopeful there'd be two new maps. That would be really cool. Ooh, yeah. I think. It's been a while since we've had a new map release, yeah. so yeah. And sorry, did you say? Sorry, did you say this is going to retail or is it coming to crowdfunding? Kickstarter, Kickstarter. yeah, crowdfunding. It's coming to Kickstarter in October of this year. the The interesting thing about, I guess, the leader games expansions is that there's always the factions and then something else, and so yeah. a map or um, a new deck or both or oh, both, yes extra things uh, from uh, what I've heard Cole say before the hardest thing to balance is a new deck yeah so I think that would be unlikely but but I would love to be surprised by that Mm. Um, so yeah this is I'm definitely excited about this can't can't wait to that's awesome that's really exciting especially when it's your favorite game and you're just hungry for more content for it to bring especially because the factions are so asymmetric it really does breathe new life into the game it's not just a yeah. expansion to a euro yeah it, it it will feel like it brings almost brand new games to the mm, game system mm. because yeah. they are that influential in the board state in the interaction between players it's yeah it, obviously the more factions they've added on over time it just creates all these weird types of games that you can experience mm. with them yeah yeah, no, that's really cool. Well, that's what has us fired up this week. Our question of the pod is what's got you fired up? We'd love to hear what you guys are excited about. And that brings us to the end of the show. Yeah. Jules and Lauren, how sad. <laughs> uh, so much more I didn't get to talk about, but it'll have to wait for next time. Oh, well. What do you and want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's over. We're ending the podcast. That's no, it. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> Jules, Lauren, thank you so much. It was a delight talking to you guys. Great as always. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. And bye, everyone. Play some games. See you later. Bye. 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 See ya. Uh, <laughs> no.
no one will ever All hear right. that moment, Joe. What the? Mm, mm, Joe juice. <laughs> <laughs>